Welcome to Political Trenches, local government at work. The show delves into the municipal stories that are making the municipal headlines from across Canada. Today, we're sh taking the show to Canada's founding province in the home of that lovable redhead girl, Anne with an E, Prince Edward Island. But before we do that, we have some big stories to dive into. So jump in your car and let's head across Confederation Bridge to get this episode underway. Ian, it seems like convention season has officially, unofficially wrapped up for the first half of the year. How's your last two weeks been? Uh, yeah, well, some of, a lot of the big conventions are done. Not all of them. Uh, you were rep, you were at the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. I suspect that would come up at some point today. Uh, we had a significant presence at the uh, Canadian Association of Municipal Administrators. Uh, and next week, or the week that this actually episode airs, we'll be at the Local Government Administrators Association in Canmore, Alberta. So Convention Center is winding down for sure as we head into summer, but it's not quite over yet. So let's jump into some big stories and we'll talk about FCM and CAMA a little bit later in the episode. So our first story is here in beautiful Alberta, where municipal councillors in the Fort McMurray region will now serve full term full time after a surprise vote at a council meeting in the middle of June. After a tense debate, regional municipality of Wood Buffalo councillors voted six to three in favor of changing their positions from being part-time to becoming full-time councillors. Now it's unclear at this time what the change will mean for potential raises or job expectations. Now the change went into effect on Wednesday, June 12th. The motion not on council's original agenda and was added at the beginning of the council meeting by Councillor Kendrick Cardinal, who also put a motion forward to waive the notice period for the motion and opted instead to push the motion through that evening. That motion was approved in a five to four vote. That meant the public was not offered an opportunity to speak on the change from part time to full time councillors. Quote, I think it's pertinent and important that it's done today, end quote, Cardinal stated. Now, according to Cardinal, he brought the motion forward because there needs to be a shift in how we do things in the community, and it's the people's inclusion, end quote. Now, according to the municipality's candidate guide to municipal elections, as of 2020, councillors were paid $46,200 per year, though that number is subject to annual adjustments. Now, a spokesperson for the municipality said that in an email to CBC News, where this article comes from, the municipality does not have a plan in place for enacting the transition. Quote, further investigation and analysis are required to understand the implications and next steps necessary to implement the decision effectively, said the statement. So, Ian, the question I have for you to kick off this segment is, what are the potential benefits or potential drawbacks for a community having full-time counselors compared to part-time counselors? Well, first of all, Chris, the idea of a full-time counselor is fairly rare. That the, the, like the vast, vast majority of municipalities across the country will have part-time counselors, and some of them very part-time, including up till now, of course, the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo in northern Alberta. There are, to your your point, uh, benefits and drawbacks to this. First of all, I'm a little surprised that this happens so quickly. If it is something that required some good deliberation or some public engagement, that didn't happen. Uh, so there may well be some backlash to this. I guess I'd be a bit, bit philosophical about this, that, of course, I shouldn't say of course, the most municipal acts, if not all municipal acts, outline what the role of a councillor is. And typically, the what you get, quote, paid for, unquote, is uh, showing up to meetings, uh, doing the business of the municipality. Most uh, acts would say that uh, the public facing work that you do, community events, cutting ribbons, attending external organizational meetings, those sort of things are, I mean, for, for want of a better word, voluntary, i.e. they're not in the act. So the philosophical piece to this is about whether they should be whether council members should be full time to recognize those pseudo volunteer activities or whether they should be part time and therefore otherwise engaged in their community through things like careers and more spending time with family and more social events, that sort of thing. So I do recognize, however, particularly in larger municipalities like Wood Buffalo, it's tough to hold down a regular job. I've often said it's hard to work at the hardware store when you have the Friday afternoon shift 
be on a regular basis because your schedule as a counselor is so erratic, unless you're your own boss, in which case there's some possibility to that. So on that, for that reason, it kind of makes sense then to recognize the value these people are providing. But on the other side, the proponents of small government will certainly be chafing at this. It's not like there's a lot of dollars involved in Wood Buffalo as opposed to the entire budget, but it's uh, it's certainly something to be considered. The, the, the proponents of professional government, if you like, or professional governors may well like this. So, I mean, you're, you you started off by asking what's good and what's bad. The good is, of course, more dedicated time towards the focus on the community. For reference in Alberta, they're including Wood Buffalo now. There are only, to my mind, four full-time councillor roles in the province. There are more mayors who are full-time, but the, the council members, individual council members, I think there are only four of them, including Edmonton and Calgary and now two others. So it's not something that's very common. The downside, of course, to this is the potentially not being a regular citizen, if you like, or turning politics into a career, which sometimes happens. And again, those sorts of things are philosophical as well. Some people may say those are good. Some people may say they're bad. Okay, so my follow up question was going to be about something that you have just gone through with the municipality here in Alberta, and that is the remuneration advisory committee that some municipalities strike to potentially mm -hmm. see if there's a need for an increase or a decrease or uh, travel expenses for counselors, because having a counselor vote on their own increase or decrease is quite honestly, quite conflicting. I'm looking at this and thinking to myself, should this have not gone gone through the proper sort of channels and gone to that sort of committee, that residential <laughs> advisory committee, because I'm seeing a backlash here. Like you talk about that small town, awesome. small government proponent and people are struggling right now. Is Does it look good for counselors to vote, vote for themselves to get a full-time job in some sense? We actually were asked many years ago now to participate in a citizens assembly for the city of Lethbridge in Alberta with the same question in mind. They had counselors who were, and still are in fact, part-time. They engaged a representative group of citizens de demographically, geographically representative to say, should we be moving counselors from part-time to full-time? Uh, and Lethbridge is a big city. And the ultimately the re, the recommendation to council from the citizens commission was committee was leave it alone. The councillors are part time because of the rules that are in in Alberta, the municipal government act, that there is a recognition that the other stuff that you do is, is I've said this before is voluntary. But lots of municipalities use external organizations, committees, groups to provide input on councillor remuneration whether that's salaries or benefits or anything to do with whatever compensation they happen to receive. And that gives some legitimacy to the decision that council ultimately has to make because com compensation is part of the budget and council has to pass the budget. Therefore, any changes to compensation are changes to the budget and council has to vote on their own salaries. And it just is right across the country. Who else is going to vote on councilor salaries? So no, no matter how deep the engagement is, ultimately the final decision is councilor, is councils. And if they have some wise counsel going in from whomever, that provides a little bit of backstop to any decision that council chooses to make. Now, I should note just for transparency's sake, because uh, uh, the mayor of, Wood, or of the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo, Sandy Bowman, did put out a statement on social media the day after this was announced. And he said that he wished that they would have had some time because two councillors who were not in the council meeting were not in attendance. And because it was such a close vote for both of the two motions, one to mm -hmm. move it forward and one for the change, uh, there could have been a different outcome. But democracy sure. is as it is. And I just want to put that on the record. So we're going to head to our second story here. And we're heading back to, well, not back, but we're heading to the Maritimes. And Nova Scotia municipalities that pay for RCMP have been examining their police oversight boards or starting them in light of recommendations from last year's report on the province's mass shooting. Some longtime joint boards are breaking up to focus on their own issues. Others say joining with neighbours makes more sense. The Mass Casualty Commission report last year said Nova Scotia municipalities need to revitalize police boards by providing them enough funding to function properly and training their members 
and police liaisons to understand their responsibilities. Mayor Jamie Myra of the town of Lunenburg, which hasn't had a board for years, said in an interview that, quote, unfortunately, it took a mass casualty report to, of one of the most tragic events that has ever happened in Nova Scotia to highlight some of the deficiencies, end quote. Lunenburg's council recently suggested forming a joint board with nearby Lunenburg County municipalities that use the RCMP. The mayor said it made sense because they often deal with the same issues and the officers the town pays for are stationed in the county's detachment. Quote, you have more diverse citizens that are that can get on the committee, more diverse situations, Myra said, and things that happen just outside of our four square kilometers still impact our town, end quote. The municipalities of Mahone Bay and Chester declined, saying their individual boards worked well. They say they don't want to weaken the local input because a joint board would have a reduced number of citizens and councillors from each community. Now, Ian, what are the key benefits do you see in forming a joint police oversight board or in a broader context in general of all boards between neighboring municipalities as suggested by Mayor Jamie Myra? Yeah, the so first of all, this only, as you have suggested, it only applies to the RCMP where it's paid service for standalone police services across the country. There are independent or at least there are dedicated police commissions, police boards uh, in that oversight role, because we as citizens allow the police to enforce or require the police to enforce whatever the laws of the land happen to be in our particular jurisdiction. So no citizens around, no need for law enforcement. But the the because we allow ourselves to be governed, like by local governments in this case, uh, we have appointed local boards of directors to oversee that. In the same way with police, we have or we have considered how best to provide some sort of oversight to that functioning, how we allow ourselves to be policed. So insight over sorry, oversight becomes important, whether it's through individual boards, boards like this, individually or collectively with police commissions. They do have to be independent of governments, like not under government order, if you like. And they must have solid rules. They've got to have the possibility of being unresponsive. You've got to have the deal with the possibility of a police service or a police force being unresponsive or going rogue. So you need this sort of oversight. In terms of whether it is preferable to for individual municipalities or for uh, regions, it probably depends on the size of the municipality or the region. Now, Nova Scotia doesn't have very many municipalities, period. So the population per municipality in Nova Scotia is higher than it is probably in most, if not all, other provinces. So it, it, then that way, the, the, the local oversight board kind of makes sense just because it's a large population. However, uh, law enforcement or the need to provide law enforcement doesn't stop at a municipal boundary. So there are certainly arguments to be made for making this effort brought more broad. At some point, how far do you stop? Because everybody is somebody else's neighbor. So conceivably, it could end up being the entire province, but that just doesn't seem to make sense. So I think what they are suggesting here is a little bit of pros and cons. If the police, the, sorry, if the, like the federal police in this case, who are acting as the provincial police, are also being asked to enforce local rules as well, the more diversity of local rules across various municipal boundaries make, makes that additionally complex. Uh, so I, I'm, I kind of think that local is the way to go in terms of oversight. And in these cases, it's not like these are police commissions in that they, they direct the police. It seems more like they are police oversight and advisory, like the eyes and ears of the community providing recommendations to the RCMP rather than providing direction to the RCMP. Also, we recognize that policing is the largest single cost, external cost to municipalities for the most part, or close to it in a lot of other places. So there are a lot of dollars at stake. And when we, when that is the case, uh, local people probably want to make sure, A, that those dollars are spent locally, and B, that they are spent locally on things that are important to the people who live there. Uh, recognizing, too, that the, these boards need to stick to their roles as either advisory or as governance but they're not the operation. They're not policing experts necessarily or public safety experts in the same way that counselors aren't greater drivers or lifeguards. So they need to know their role and you need to have the rules, know the rules and follow the rules. So those are the sorts of things I think about. So on balance, I think local is probably the way to go.
So we're going to turn to our last story, but before we do that, I've got to ask a simple question, as we usually do on the third uh, the third story. Got any unpaid parking tickets from before <laughs> 2001 there, Ian, from Ottawa? <laughs> Let me check my pockets, Chris. <laughs> the reason I ask is because the city of Ottawa is giving up on collecting outstanding parking tickets issued before amalgamation in 2001. Now, the write-off will forgive 71,835 outstanding parking tickets dating back to 1989, according to a report from Deputy City Treasurer Joseph Mooney, tabled earlier this month to the city's Finance and Corporate Services Committee. Now, the total amount being forgiven is more than $2.6 million. Not a drop in the bucket, if you ask me. The tickets were issued in the former municipalities of Cumberland, Osgood, Colchester, Vanier, Nepean, Ottawa, Goulburn, Canada, and the regional municipality of ottawa Carleton. These nine were among the 11 municipalities amalgamated into the single city of Ottawa in 2001. There are several criteria for determining if an account is uncollectible. The deputy clerk told CBC News in an interview, in some cases, the city doesn't have sufficient information to collect on the debt or... In my favorite case, the person is dead. Not sure if that's an important <laughs> indication, but if they're dead, they're probably not going to get their money. Ian, municipalities are hard up for cash in today's economic climate. Is the municipality doing the right thing here, moving forward and forgiving potential sources of revenue that they haven't collected since, well, 1989? Yeah, I think they probably are. I don't, I, the 72,000 tickets and the millions of dollars you've recognized there is mind boggling. Uh, but then to give up on it is, is really tough, but you are sending good money after bad. You're getting a low return on it. The, you made a reference earlier too, that the municipalities are always a little strapped for cash and they have so few revenue sources of these fees and charges of which fines would be one do become really important. But spending good money on with such a low return rate is probably not smart. Uh, I'd say, too, that people, pe not me, of course, but people often see parking tickets as optional when they're with when they're coming from a municipality, more so maybe than when they're working with a, a work uh, like parking in a private sector lot where they know that there's a little less leniency there, less likely, more likely to go to collections and to be hassled, too. Uh, this will show up on the city's balance sheet if there's a write-off or a write-down of uh, this of millions of dollars. It's going to have an impact on the balance sheet, but there's a really good reason for it, and I think it's probably more of a paper transaction as anything, even if it shows up as a, a, a like an account receivable or as a liability. Um, it's not a real one, so this is why I suggest it's probably just more of a paper transaction. I, I I laughed when I read this story because I I, kept, I went back and I tried to remember if I had any parking tickets from Ottawa that potentially could be forgiven, but unfortunately did not because I actually paid my parking tickets. Um, Ian, we'll be right back. Well, sure. Ian, we'll be right back after a quick break with the mayor of Summerside, Prince Edward Island. Welcome to the Political Trenches, local government at work. Our guest today is Summerside PEI Mayor Dan Kutcher. Mayor Kutcher was elected mayor of the city of Summerside in 2022. He's a father, a husband, lawyer, entrepreneur, volunteer, and former political advisor in my home province of Ontario. Mayor Kutcher is an active Rotarian with the Summerside Rotary Club and former board member with Easter Seals PEI and the Free Stone. He has also served as president of the Harborfront Theater Board of Directors president of the Greater Summerside Chamber of Commerce and the director with Downtown Summerside Incorporated and the Summerside Regional Development Corporation. Now, that's not all. He also serves as the Federation of Prince Edward Island Municipalities as city's town director for the Prince area of the province. With that, Mayor, welcome to the show. Great, thanks. Thanks for having me. So, Mayor, I want to start off quickly with a simple question, but it's a general question and the overarching theme of Prince Edward Island municipalities. In your opinion, what is the state of municipalities across the province of Prince Edward Island today? Well, I think it's probably similar to others across the rest of the country. Look, some of the big challenges that are facing us are not unique to Summerside. They're not unique to Prince Edward Island or to the Maritimes in Atlanta, Canada or across Canada. So, um, you know, whether those are housing, revitalizing downtowns, dealing with um, uh, increasing issues surrounding homelessness, um, 
Yeah, I, so we're all kind of in the same boat. Um, we're all struggling uh, as a certain level of government in that sort of hierarchy. And uh, But overall, I think the state and municipalities, at least from a state of the city, sort of how, how people are doing, um, I'm, I'm happy where things are at, but I'm always never complacent in terms of we've got a lot more to do. We've got a lot of things we can do better. I'll jump in now if I can. And you made a couple of, you made reference to a couple of uh, topics that we were going to bring up. And one one is really around sustainability, municipal sustainability. Can you speak to it from uh, the perspective of what Summerside is doing that you think is either unique or perhaps not particularly common around the rest of the country? Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, one of the things that uh, we're fortunate to have here in Summerside is we we own our own electric utility. And that used to be much more common across the country and, and uh, you know, consolidation and uh, changes in distribution and production of electricity changed over the decades. But Summerside held on. And about uh, 10 to 15 years ago, we made a transition to actually producing electricity. We started with four windmills, and that would be my uh, predecessor, Mayor Stewart, um, had some great vision there and um, started us down a journey towards sustainability. And two pieces to it. I think there's probably a component that was, yes, look, this is the right thing to do. We need to do our part in terms of mitigating the effects of climate change. Um, but as well as a, as a utility owner, as an owner of utility, uh, provide us an opportunity uh, to reduce the amount of power we had to purchase from off island and be able to produce our own, which created economic benefits for a city. Today, this past year, we opened the biggest um, solar farm in Atlantic Canada here in Summerside for size and scope for you, sort of 80 acres, so that'd be 46,000 panels. Then attached to it is a 10 megawatt, uh, 21 megawatt hour battery system. So that could power the city for up to five hours. So right now I can look out the window, it is sunny and I can see the flags blowing in front of city hall. It is windy. Um, when that happens, we often are producing 100% of the electricity that is being used here in Summerside within the borders of Summerside and it's clean and renewable. I understand that you're interested in how the shift towards green energy can power economic development locally and regionally as well. Is that true? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think when you know we're in a global transition in a whole bunch of different uh, facets, and one of them is the energy transition that right. uh, has been happening now for a few years and will continue to accelerate. Um, so we're really well positioned here in Summerside to be able to use um, some of our assets that we have, both of them, whether it's Wind farm, solar, uh, we're developing our uh, Atlanta Canada's first uh, net zero industrial facility here in the city. We work with a, an organization, a company here in Summerside called Blue Wave AI that does load management and growth management. Uh, growth you know, manages our load uh, from an electrical perspective. Um, we have a heat for less program where we store energy uh, in people's homes through a variety of means, um, hot water heaters, uh, block furnaces. Um, and so that creates an ecosystem for uh, sort of green technology, but also green jobs. So those are good jobs. They're good paying jobs, um, though it doesn't take a lot of people to run a solar farm. Um, but we have developed really uh, a living lab here in Summerside where we have sort of the, the size and space to be able to um, be nimble and innovative and then uh, attract companies to come do interesting things here, which we've done. Yeah, we're in a fundamental human business as uh, as government, and uh, as such, relationships are really important. Uh, the week this episode is uh, put to air, you will Summerside will be hosting the Atlantic Mayor's Caucus or AMC. What do you see as big topics around Atlantic Canada that you and your colleagues are going to be uh, having a conversation about? Yeah, two big pieces uh, for the Atlantic Mayor's Congress uh, coming up next week here in Summerside. One, housing. Housing will cover more than half of the agenda. All the different components of housing as well, right? When you say housing to one person, uh, it means something different than when you say housing to somebody else. You can talk about housing and you can talk about someone might jump to immediately to uh, unhoused populations and homelessness, whereas someone else might jump to making sure we have a diverse, uh, attainable supply of housing for different individuals in different stages of their life. So that's a main focus. We've got, I think now, all of the um, Atlantic housing ministers coming for one of the panels. Minister Sean Fraser, the federal minister of housing, is here. Um, we've got Lisa Raid and Mike Moffat, one of the housing policy gurus here. So 
we're, we're done our best to get all the right people in the room and it and it's coincided with um where we are here at city of summerside it's next week literally the day before this uh the amc starts we have our first council meeting where we introduce um significant changes to our official plan all geared around housing and the new zoning bylaw so we're into the middle of our public consultation phase and we were one of the first municipalities in, across Canada, I think we were 19th, um, to receive the Housing Accelerator Fund um, approval and funding. And so we're at that same stage where, you know, Calgary, Toronto, Halifax have been going through these difficult sometimes discussions at the community level. And um, we're right there with them. You you first talked about public consultation. And I've got to know, because I, I ask this show, I ask this question on my other show all the time, but from your perspective, do you get a sense that people are engaged on the issues that are in going on in Summerside? When you ask people for their opinion or how you think the official plan should be developed or how a public hearing should go, do you get a sense that people are actually engaged at the municipal level in Summerside and they want to give your feedback to you about what should be going on in the community? Or is it the age old adage, as long as my garbage is picked up and my water's turned on i'm happy with what's going on in the community yeah both and public uh, dialogue and consultation i would say meaningful consultation um and uh, consultation with intent is really really important um it is a, increasingly a challenge where we are living in this world of you know 40 second sound bites um where information is coming from a variety of different places some good some not for communities like ours that used to have a central point for you know we've been our local newspaper which is where everything would have been put out everyone would have known what was happening today things can be coming in, you know, in the newspaper but people aren't necessarily reading it's coming on a website here it's coming on social media there and people miss things and then at the end of the day um to sort of go back uh years that they have a good friend to just say look people lead uh, are busy and lead just in time lives and um, if it isn't affecting them sometimes that's not the type of thing they want to get engaged with or have the time to uh, consider and get engaged with um, but I think as a municipal leader it's really incumbent on us to proceed um, always uh, in a way that gives people as many opportunities as possible for feedback because we want feedback <laughs> this is a it is, at least this is my approach. It isn't like I'm not going out asking people for people for feedback and I already have a We already know what we want to do. I genuinely want to know what, what people um, uh, have to have to think. And so their engagement is really, really important. So uh, I think it's also incumbent on us to make sure that when we uh, do go through our public engagement processes, we go beyond the bare minimum and we listen with intent and we actually engage with people and uh, and respond to them. I'm going to change this from a topic a discussion on topics to a discussion of the role of, of mayor as well. And you've been mayor now for what a year and a half or so. Um, yeah, I looked at a sorry. Yeah, I looked at a picture of myself the other day. <laughs> I, had, I looked younger. <laughs> All right. In eighteen <laughs> I used months. To always think like, oh yeah, that would. That would. All politicians they always look older, but anyway, maybe we always do. But sorry, to maybe. No, no, that's okay. I'm interested in what made you decide uh, you want you were interested in the role of mayor, and um, as a follow up to that, kind of what you is the job what you thought it was going to be. Yeah, uh, it what made me interested is like I've always I, I love I, I love cities. I think cities are so fascinating. They're the only natural political governing unit. They they are they are where people even if if we had no other levels of government, we would still have cities. We've always had cities throughout the history of civilization and. Um, I've always found that really, really fascinating. And cities are where you get the birthplace of arts and culture. Without cities, you don't have uh, mm -hmm. you don't have organized sport. You don't have any of these things that really are uh, so unique to to humans, to our species. Which I so I you know on my desk back there, I've got the Lapham's Quarterly uh, Cities uh, Edition because I just think it's I've always been fascinated by it. Um, as well, I've always you know. For whatever reason, uh, I think it's incumbent on, on us to give back and to uh, and to recognize the fact that if you know if my kids' friends don't do well, my kids aren't going to do well. And as a community, and I've spent many years involved in the community in a variety of different capacities, whether it's for not for profits or for chambers of commerce and this type of thing. And I've been a business owner here as well, so. Um, 
when I sold my business uh, a few years ago, I had an opportunity to step back and look at what I wanted to do next. Um, our city is growing and changing. And um, the previous mayor, who was a friend of mine, but uh, had been the mayor for 30 years with an interruption for four. Um, I thought there was a need for a change. And uh, so I went about doing it and um, you know, the residents were supportive and uh, and I've just been doing my best ever since. So, it, and does it go to what I expected? I I didn't have any specific expectations as to what it would be. Um, I had a rough idea, but also recognized that I, I wouldn't really know until I got there. And I'm still figuring, I'm still figuring it out. <laughs> um, <laughs> this, this week, I was like, oh, I've learned a couple of things this week. Um, and I think that's what makes it interesting um, and engaging in the, the municipal politics. We, you know, one minute I'm sitting having a conversation about, um, you know, or trying to find a pathway to build a hydrogen plant so that we can take our excess uh, clean energy and store it and deploy it. And then the next minute I'm on the phone talking with someone about, um, you know, someone's grass that's too long and how the rats are in their house, right? You get both ends of the spectrum and there's never a dull day. So I really <laughs> enjoy it. So I have one last question, and it, yeah. it's 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 an important question for myself. <laughs> but uh, we are on the cusp of summer. What is there fun to do in Summerside during the summer? Oh man, awesome! Well, there are lots. Of PEI goes. <laughs> the population of PEI it increases. Forget about the exponential growth from immigration. That summertime is where exponential growth really arrives here <laughs> with Denver Island, and you can tell it in our communities, and you can tell it here in Summerside. Um, so we've got a ton of things on the go. One thing that I'm really proud of this year is uh, we sort of reimagined our Canada Day, which is coming up in a couple of weeks. I can't believe we're almost in July. Um, we have some incredible musicians, particularly a number of incredible musicians, but some really incredible folk and country musicians, female singers from Summerside that we just sometimes don't play here. So uh, one of them is blowing up right now, uh, Allie Walker in the States. I think she just signed on with, with Sony. Um, so we were, you know, we were really lucky. We got Allie to come to headline our uh, Canada Day festivities, mm -hmm. and we've turned our Canada Day event. We still have our some of our regular programming, but we've turned it into a bit of a music festival um, centered around um, artists from here in Summerside, and will be, I think it'll be pretty awesome. So I'm pretty excited for that uh, that to get started. Mayor, I want to thank you, and I want to thank you from both Ian and myself for joining us today in the political trenches and sitting down and talking about Summerside, but municipalities in the province of uh, Prince Edward Island. So thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Ian. I really appreciate uh, joining you today. Thanks. So our full interview with Mayor Kutcher will be airing next Wednesday. We'll be right back after a quick message. Ian, another great episode dedicated to a great province of Prince Edward Island. It's always great to sit down with municipal leaders, especially today with Mayor Dan Kucher of Somerset. Yeah, it's so uh, PEI is on my list of one of the places, one of the three provinces I have yet to visit, or provinces and territory. So it certainly is on my list. I love the way that people are passionate about where they live. And I see that across the country with people who are heavily involved in local government. So um, the mayor was no different than that. So yeah, it was a really good episode. Um, I want to just take a moment here for a second and I'm going to sort of uh, boast a tutor our horn a little bit. Um, for those who came up to, at FCM to myself and talked about listening to all three of our shows, my shows and this show here, The Political Trenches, thank you so much. Uh, we we love doing this. I, I enjoy talking about municipal issues with Ian on a week, on a bi-weekly, bi-monthly basis, I should say. And it's always great to hear from people that are listening to the show and actually listening on a regular basis. So thank you so much to those who have reached out and actually said, hey, we listen to you and uh, we love what you're doing. It, it truly means a lot to hear feedback about what we're putting out so thank you so much to the people at fcm who did come up and speak to us or well speak yeah to that's pretty fantastic <laughs> uh, it's pretty cool yeah so with that we'll be back in two weeks time we have two episodes left before we take our summer hiatus in august and then we'll be back in september so until uh july uh ian always a pleasure we'll talk to you again soon chris <laughs>